Hello, my name is Dan Taylor. I'm a PhD student at the University of Roehampton and I want to talk to you today about how to read a historical source. Okay, so there's two sides to every story, right? One of the first skills of a historian is to recognise bias or partiality in a source. But here I want to quickly talk about um, some quick tools for reading any historical source. History hacks, if you like. I'm going to argue that in order to understand the historical significance and usefulness of a source, we need to think about asking that source the right questions. These questions can be asked of most sources, but in this case I want to look at a particularly disquieting and controversial area of history, and that's the Holocaust. So, bias. That thing that we as historians are trained to sniff out, like cartoon villains in our primary and secondary sources. Bias is important. From it we can estimate from the author's background, their associations, their expressed aims, the implications of their work. It's in the language, if it's inflammatory, if it raises or demeans a position, if only one aspect of an event's evidence is cited or if it's falsified. Can we be immune to bias though? Can we be bias free? As historians our task is to collect evidence and analyse it, which means not simply asking if a source is biased or not, but to ascertain its historical significance to the questions we ask of it. So think about this when approaching a primary source. Primary sources, as Ludmilla Jordanova defines in history in practice, are those original documents of the time that, quote, bear direct witness to the p events, people, processes, and so on of that moment, end quote. It's easy to feel overwhelmed by all these primary sources bearing direct witness, especially where those witnesses contradict each other. Recording the testimonies of facts alone is insufficient. We need to understand the historical significance to the questions we are investigating. This means that questions of bias are useful but in themselves too simplistic. Let's take the case of the Holocaust using five sources I've found and which can also be read in the accompanying exercise. These are five primary sources, the first four produced during the time of the Holocaust and the final source based on experiences that were then written down two years afterwards. So what are we looking for? So we might be looking at how the mass extermination of the European Jews was made possible during the 1940s. We may be asking how the decisions to construct the death camps were made which would lead back to the proposal of a final solution which would bring us back to source one. A report from the meeting of Nazi government officials and SS officers at Wannsee in Berlin and the production of the Wannsee Protocol, which explicitly outlines detailed plans for exterminating Jewish people, either through overwork or through direct death camps. The source is so biased to the extent that it euphemistically describes extermination as a final solution to a European Jewish question formulated by Nazi authorities where death comes by being eliminated by natural causes, and where issues of resistance or submission are understood in terms of natural selection. It might also indicate the extent of the SS's planning in its population estimates, in the extent of the Nazi government's bureaucratic operations across its occupied states, and those it still plans to occupy, split into groups A and B. What else does it indicate? When using sources that are deeply disturbing in their implications, we must take care to look for their historical significance. Okay, so let's think about this for a moment. R.G. Collingwood has for historians two concepts for reading source material. Interpolation and interrogation. Okay, so interpolation. This means filling in the gaps in historical records, using one source to contextualise or corroborate an offer. Interrogation is questioning the source's use, its method, its purpose. Many good sources were never produced for the sake of posterity or historical instruction. So what we need to do is cross-examine the source, as Mark Block puts it, using our research questions. Not recording words, but questioning sources, examining their answers, examining their silences. So with our second source, let's approach this with an eye to its historical significance. Who produced it? and for what purpose. It's a private communication from an SS officer to a business, Toff and Sons. It's a year after the Wansley Protocol. What does it indicate? Let's interrogate. In its detailed instructions about the components required, 
It reveals an undressing room and the need for an air extraction unit, something which could, if we can find other sources to corroborate, indicate that suppliers were informed or aware of what their parts were being used for. We could investigate the operations of Topf and Sons and question the extent to which German businesses knowingly profited from the construction and actions of the concentration camps. A shower room would not require an air extraction unit, you'd think, but a gas chamber might. Some interpolation is needed. It also emphasises speed, urgency on the part of the Germans, which could then be combined with other historical sources to reflect on perhaps the scale of bureaucratic involvement of implementing the final solution, or of possible guilt, or a fear of being exposed either internationally or by historical posterity within the German government and the SS. Our third source comes from an audio transcription of Heinrich Himmler, lead of the Nazi SS. He's addressing SS officers at Posen in occupied Poland again in 1943. So, what is the context here? What might be the purpose of Himmler's address? His officers may be demoralised. Perhaps he needs to instil discipline. Perhaps some have been defying orders. We need to examine the source further to find out. But let's interpolate too. What is the significance of this source? Again, it tells us something about the Holocaust, about the involvement of officers and the frequency of piles of corpses. Does it also indicate what the SS viewed as a lack of public resolve in fully implementing the final solution? In interpolating it with others, we might think of the Nazis' reluctance to be discovered carrying out the final solution, of ensuring that all traces of the camps were destroyed. This source testifies that the top Nazi SS commanders were knowingly responsible in enacting the mass killings of European Jews and indicates some of their rationale behind it. Understanding the historical context is crucial here. Our fourth source comes from another leading Nazi, this time Rudolf Hoss. We need to investigate the source here. Who is Hoss and what is the context of what he's saying? So. He's on trial as a major war criminal, the source caption tells us, and this will reflect how he explains or omits his actions whilst on trial. Let's interrogate that. He tells us that he was ordered to establish extermination facilities at Auschwitz in June 1941, indicating that a programme for exterminating the European Jewish population had already begun before the Wannsee Protocol. Indeed, his testimony tells us that there were several extermination camps already, and that Hearst visited these in order to assess what methods were most efficient. This use of euphemistic language, like liquidated, is similar to our first source. What does this source tell us? Why is Hearst open in detail about his actions compared to the Wansi Protocol? Again, interpolate and interrogate. The bias of the source isn't in question, but what we need to think about is its historical significance and relevance to our questions. This leads to our fifth source from Primo Levi, an Italian Jewish chemist who lived in and survived Auschwitz, and who wrote his testimony in 1947. What does his mention of irregularities indicate about the desire for efficiency in the German approach? What does his discussion of a camp hierarchy tell us about the conditions there? We need to interrogate the source. What purposes did Levy have in explaining in detail his life in Auschwitz? And how does it contrast with the Nazi plans to conceal and cover up what they called a final solution? Does Levy's testimony indicate that only a minority of leaders were involved issuing orders? Or in its descriptions of bribery, was there a more extensive level of involvement throughout the camp? What does it tell us about conditions in the camps, of overcrowding, of the beliefs of prisoners about themselves, about survival? and about the practical purposes of the camp. In many instances of historical inquiry, particularly those concerning atrocities, genocides, or events with political implications for the present, it's impossible to be value-free, to be bias-free. So as historians, we need to be aware of our own values and assumptions that we bring. The Holocaust was one of the most horrific and abhorrent events in human history. As historians, it is not enough to seek a holy grail of a bias-free source a factual eyewitness testimony. Instead, let's take home these things. Ask what the source is saying, its content, its context. Who is it produced for and why? 
interpolate and interrogate and always cross-examine. Ultimately, the value of the source is in its relevance and significance to the questions that we as historians ask of it. Thank you.